Welcome to my YouTube channel. I don't generally talk about myself on the videos because I want the videos to be non-branded so that they can be applied in different contexts. However, given that the channel has attracted a few subscribers now, I thought it might be a good idea to tell a little bit about myself and where the content for this channel comes from and why I do these videos and how I do them. So let's start with myself. My name is Mikko Rönkö. I'm an associate professor of entrepreneurship at Jyväskylä University School of Business and Economics in Finland. I specialize in quantitative research methods and I do empirical research on entrepreneurship. I'm not going to talk about my empirical research in this video because this channel is about research methods and not about entrepreneurship. I like to publish in journals such as organizational research methods and psychological methods. I have also published about methods in various business journals, for example, Journal of Operations Management and MIS Quarterly to give few examples. And I do lots of reviewing for different business journals and some other social science journals as well. I'm on the editorial boards of Organizational Research Methods, which is Academic Management's Research Methods Division journal. And I also do a service for entrepreneurship theory and practice. I'm a department editor at Journal of Operations Management, managing the empirical research methods in operations management department. In that role, I pre-screen a number of manuscripts per year, and I make all the decisions about methodological papers that are submitted to that journal. So I'm mostly known for being a method specialist, and I also teach research methods in a few different universities in Finland, and I've also given courses in other universities outside Finland as well. So that's briefly about myself. How did I learn research methods and uh, what are the important things that you need to know about myself and whether you can trust what I say on this channel? Generally, you shouldn't trust people based on what they say, but based on what they demonstrate and prove. And whenever I make a claim, I tend to have a citation at here at the bottom of the slide supporting the claim. But about my background, I have an engineering degree in industrial management. I had a major in uh, strategy and entrepreneurship and a minor in computer science. And the computer, si computer science minor was very useful because being able to program computers is a very useful skill when you do actual empirical research. And it's pretty much required if you want to do any work where you study methods by simulating data. So I have a, this is programming background. I also have a strong background in math. I took extended math in both high school and the university. And for that reason, most of the things that I read that might seem a bit complicated to most social science researchers is a bit easier for me. However, I'm not a statistician. So if someone gives me a, a statistics book, that's uh, mostly Greek to me. I understand matrices now. I know derivatives. I know partial derivatives. I know what integration means and that kind of thing. It is helpful, but I'm by no means an expert in actual computational statistics or statistics. I focus on how these techniques are applied in social sciences and apply, and apply them myself as well. When I was doing my doctorate, I of course did the research methods courses offered by my school, the Aalto University Department of Industrial Engineering and Management, those were pretty good. But I think that what really made the difference for me was two courses that I took at the psychology department. So in a typical business school, we, do, we don't have as much methodological training as they have in psychology programs. And then going and listening to an international expert in a psychology department really helped me to understand some of the basics in structural legacy modeling. And then I started developing my understanding of other techniques based on that understanding of structural legacy model. After that, I was basically self-taught. So I read good books, uh, quite a few books. I started with Cohen's book. I don't think that the Cohen's regression correlation book is, is that good. But I started with that. It contains some math. I tried to understand it. It was difficult. I read first three chapters and I decided that this is going to take a lot more time than I have at my hands now. 
that was maybe eight years ago, I put the book away and I returned to it later. And then I realized that, well, that book has some good material, but it's not the best book. Then I started looking at other books. Recently, I have read a lot of Woolridge, the introductory book first, and now I'm working through the panel data analysis. And uh, generally, you look at who is, the, who is the big name, who has published a lot about this technique, you find their book, and then you just start reading it, and, and learning happens. Also, what I think has been important in my learning is being able to simulate data sets on a computer. If I can simulate the data set and then apply a technique to that simulated data set to check if I get a correct answer, then I know for sure that I applied the technique correctly. So it comes back to the engineering background. It helps you to do these uh, learning opportunities for yourself. And I actually wrote my dissertation about methods too. My PhD is in industry engineering and management. My major is strategies and entrepreneurship. But I wrote a dissertation about the misuse of statistical techniques in management research. Why did I take such a turn? It happened that I, I published a paper in organizational research methods during my PhD studies and my actual research had stalled. And then I decided, that, well, I have this one paper now published, another one in the pipeline. And I was preparing another one for an applied journal. So that is three papers. And three papers is what is required for a dissertation. I eventually ended up writing two other papers to that dissertation to make it a five, because then it was a more coherent package than just three. And, and that's my dissertation. Since then, I've been asked to teach research methods. And I've also published some articles about methodological issues in, for example, organizational research methods and psychological methods. So that's my background, that's how I learned methods. Let's take a look at this channel then. So what is this channel about? This channel is, is not statistics channel. This is not a math channel. It's applied research methods channel. So uh, I teach applied research methods. I don't teach how regression works, how you invert and multiply matrices to get the betas. That's for others to do. Of course, I know how that works because I must, because I teach this stuff, but I don't think that is uh, the most important thing for an applied researcher to, to know. So I'm teaching how these techniques are applied and, and why, under which conditions can we trust the results that the techniques provide, under which conditions we should use other techniques. This is mostly about quantitative research. I have a few videos about qualitative research, mostly for master's level students and I focus on management and social sciences because management is my field and generally social sciences, research methods in social sciences work quite similarly uh, regardless of whether you're working in, in sociology, psychology or management or some other subfield of social science. So they are all the same methodologically. So that's why I call this a social science focused channel. The videos on the channel are, can be viewed in a few different ways. So I have about 150 to 200 videos at the moment. And you can, of course, view individual videos here. But I also like to organize these as playlists. And the playlists are organized around the topic. And that might be a topic that I often have to tell authors when uh, in the role of being an editor. Or the topic might be a paper that I'm working on. Or the topic might be something that I discuss in a seminar for PhD students or master's students. And then I have these videos arranged under this playlist under the topics. And I want to produce more of these playlists. So this list of playlists is probably going to uh, be a lot bigger sometime in the future. Now, so that is the channel. Why do I publish these videos? Well, why do I do the videos in the first place? The videos are primarily done for purposes other than this channel. So most of the videos on the channel are something that I have taught or something that I will teach to an actual class where I see students in person. And I like to uh, do blended learning nowadays where I pre-record all the lecture content and then the seminars with the PhD students are 100% about discussing the material. So I don't lecture when I see students. I think it's a lot more efficient that they watch the the lecture content on their own pace when they're at home and then 
when we are together, that's quality time where we talk about things. They ask questions, they challenge me sometimes, which I find very interesting uh, in a positive way because then I really get to, uh, to uh, evaluate my own assumptions and my whether I've actually myself understood the technique correctly. And those are good for learning for both ways. Sometimes a student spots a mistake, then I'll fix it and I'll fix the video on the channel as well. Another reason why I do these videos is that I like to publish about methods. And um, sometimes when we publish about methods, for example, in organizational research methods, the papers themselves tend to become complicated and long. And for some people, understanding is easier if they see the same thing explained in, in video form. So for the last couple of things that I've worked on, I have actually prepared a playlist and that playlist is provided as an online supplemental material for the article. I'll show you an example on the next slide. And the third reason why I do videos is that in the role, in my role as a journal editor, I reject papers or I ask authors to revise papers quite often for the same reason. So there are maybe like five reasons why I ask authors to revise that cover 80 to 90% of the cases of a revised essay. So this is a methodology that applies. So instead of writing, just providing the written explanation of the problem and how it could be addressed, I provide the written explanation, citations, and I also provide a playlist of my videos of how I think the problem that the authors are facing could be addressed using modern techniques. So that's the third thing that I use the videos for. Now, the sec second question is, why do I publish the videos that I've made for other purposes on this YouTube, YouTube channel? Well, why not? It's simple to do. These videos originally, when I record them, they go to a university server and I have a script that automatically uh, goes to my folder and synchronizes all the new content to the channel. So there's really, really no cost for me for uploading new stuff. And I think it's useful for the researcher community to have this kind of material. Quite often, when I look for, uh, when I want me to teach something new, I start to look at, okay, so how have others taught this material? Or if I need to learn a new concept, I need to do some reading, or I might go to YouTube and search for a video. For example, when I was doing uh, a, a videos or, or study material for Arlan Bond dynamic panel model estimator last spring, I couldn't really find a good explanation on YouTube. So I thought that if I upload my video, then there's at least one, uh, in my opinion, good explanation of what that technique is about. And uh, people have liked this video and it has actually uh, received some views already. This hopefully makes me famous in the long run. So, um, but it, it will not make me rich. So this video, this channel will be strictly uh, non-commercial, no advertisements. I get paid by the university to produce learning content and teaching content and this is just sharing what I have paid to produce anyway. So uh, there is no, no financial interest involved. Let's take a look at a couple of examples of where I use the videos. This is a paper published by John Antonakis, Nicola Bastardos and myself and in organizational research methods we talk about random effect models and the random effect assumption. You can read the actual paper if you want or you can go to this uh, video where John and I explained the paper. This was shot in Lausanne when I was visiting there with John. And or you can go to this playlist that contains about 10 or so smaller videos where I break down the, the key concept of that paper starting from what is unobserved heterogeneity. So I, I tend to do this kind of things uh, that when I explain something in a paper, then I uh, do a simpler version in a video. So if you like the video, if you learn something from the video, then uh, please cite the paper because that's of course the original source for the things that I talk about in the video. It's just me talking about this research and this is the research that informs us, not me explaining it to people. Then I do these, uh, use these videos on my teaching. I have two courses on PhD level. I teach the first course in Aalto. I used to teach that when I was working in Aalto and they wanted me to continue. And I also brought the course here. I used to work for the information systems department. That's the TJ, uh, TJ code. And now the, the code in the middle is for the business school where I work now. 
and the strategy on entrepreneurship research. So this is for postgraduate students. I take students from these different universities, different study programs together, and then we learn the basics about how to do quantitative research on a peer review level. Then I also have an advanced course that I developed in the fall 2019, spring 2020, and this talks about econometrics, structural ecosystem modeling, advanced measurement, that kind of concept. So it's kind of like if, if I look back and, and I, I think what would I, I have liked to know when I started studying research methods, then I put all that stuff in the, in the course. Also, if I think uh, I sent lots of articles to reviewers for being methods checked, and uh, this did a course contained things that I wish all the reviewers that I use would know to evaluate papers better. So these are the two courses, and uh, they're hosted on Aalto. I work at the University of Jyväskylä, but I initially developed this course for Aalto, and I decided to just keep it there because I will have Aalto students there anyway instead of moving it to our own Moodle. It's open access, so it's uh, this Moodle instance allows guest access, so if you type the PU codes there, you will find the latest instance of my course. You can check, for example, the syllabi, what are the materials that I give my students to read, what is the context where I use individual videos, because these are, are structured as units. Each unit has like 10, 15 videos and then readings, assignments, and so on for the students to work on. It's not a full online course, but it could develop, it, it, both of these could be developed uh, to be fully online. I expect to teach uh, the first course actually online next spring because of the COVID-19 pandemic. We'll see what happens. What is my, my teaching about and, and what are some of the principles of my teaching? This uh, excerpt from the advanced course syllabus gives us some idea. First, I'm not the kind of guy who tells you that under situation X, apply technique Y. So there are lots of books that tell you this kind of rules of thumb and I don't teach it that way because I don't think that it is generally true, true, always true that X always implies technique Y. And even if it did, it's useful for a researcher to understand the tools that they apply because sometimes they have a situation that is not fully covered by their if X then Y rule, but they really have to understand the trade-offs of different choices between different research designs and different analysis methods, and they need to understand how to interpret the effect. So instead of focusing on this kind of when X then do Y, I focus on explaining how and why certain techniques are used and what are the principles these techniques are based on. For example, in the regression analysis, I make the big point about linearity, which is really the most important thing in regression analysis. If you think that your XY relationship is linear, then you can pretty much always apply normal regression analysis regardless of any other consideration. Except of course, if, if X is affected by measurement error or there's endogeneity, but these are our special cases. So, so instead of saying that, okay, when dependent variable is ones and zeros, you must use logistic regression analysis, we'll focus on the principles. In the regression analysis, there is a principle is linearity. Linearity does not imply that, that, the, uh, that the dependent variable can be zero and one. You can use regression analysis with the binary dependent variable. Just to give you an example. My teaching and my examples generally come from management journals. So this is a list of management journals where I, I take my examples and when I think what do I need to teach my students, I go through these journals and I look at so what are the techniques and designs that are applied in these journals and that is the stuff that I put on my, my courses. Basic course, basic regression analysis, factor analysis, advanced course, anything else goes there. I use Stata and R as my software. Those are also the software that I apl apply empirical in empirical work and I also use M plus for both empirical research and some of the papers about methods. The examples on this channel are mostly done with R. The reason is that I've taught research methods in some places where Stata was not available and if my examples were all in Stata then I couldn't really do much. So R is always available, anyone can download it from the internet and I think it's actually a bit easier to generate data sets with R than Stata. 
and I like the uh, R's graphics a bit more than Stata's graphics, which are good anyway, but I like R a bit better. So most of my examples in R in R, generally are things that I teach are R state on M plus. I do teach SPSS as well. I don't think that's a tool for a professional researcher for a couple of reasons. First, SPSS is fairly li limited in capabilities that you can do with it. So uh, quite often researchers who apply SPSS need to have M plus or some other advanced software on the side with Stata and R the, uh, the bar for having to go to a specialized software is a lot higher because they provide so much more functionality. And the second thing is that uh, S Stata and R are a lot easier to automate than SPSS. So if you write a syntax file using SPSS, the syntax is, is horrible. Stata and R are a lot easier to use from the syntax and that, that's the more efficient way of using a statistical software, not point and click. But I do teach SPSS. I teach it because some people uh, have good reasons for using SPSS. They have, for example, very simple thing that they want to do and everyone around them uses SPSS. So in that case, it's a good choice. And I support their choice by giving all the materials on my basic course, also on SPSS. But materials on the YouTube channel are with Stata and R because those are a lot more professional tools than SPSS. How do I use these videos uh, in teaching? I, I have my courses structured as units. So uh, the basic course is eight units, the advanced course is, ten, course is 10 units. And in the beginning of the unit, the students get uh, materials, including the readings, the videos, assignments. They work on the assignments for one week. Then uh, I grade them. Then we'll talk about the material. And uh, then we have another unit going. So uh, this is uh, called blended learning. I offer the, uh, the video content, the lecture content first, and then we discuss it later. For the advanced course, it's the same, except that uh, the uh, units are a bit longer. There is more stuff for the students, students to do and so on. So this is how I apply it. I use Moodle. This is the context where I use my videos. So that's from uh, a year or two years ago. I have uh, video players where the students can view the videos that you see on the channel. And this is actually an interactive video player. So it's done with H5P Moodle component and uh, interactive video module inside H5P component. What it allows me to do is to produce these questions or different kind of tasks that the students do in the middle of the video to keep them engaged. And for example, here I'm asking, I'm, I'm talking about randomized experiments in the video and I have the students to uh, pick which of these statements is, are, are true, and then they submit, they get a score. So if I have a, a course that has maybe 70 videos, I might have on an average two tasks for each video, 140 little tasks. They are not all these check boxes. Some of them require the students to do calculations. Some of them require them to uh, fill in the blanks in statements or, or link concepts by dragging and dropping and that kind of thing. This H5P is a very useful thing, thing for online teaching and I make heavy use on it on my basic course. Now the final thing is, is how do I do the videos? So I've had a couple of people asking me, how do you make the videos look so good? Well, you need to have good teaching materials in the first place, but I, I don't think that that's the question. So people don't want to know that I use PowerPoint for preparing the slides, they want to know how is the video shot? Here's an explanation of my setup, and I also have a mobile setup, but it's better to, uh, to take a look at the, uh, the place where I actually shoot it. So when I'm recording, I'm actually in a small studio. And this is the self-service studio, and this is where, what it looks like. So I'm here, I'm here, there is this uh, kind of like um, area that is lower than the surface level, this small hole here. I'm standing on this hole, and then there's this, this green curtain here. And whatever the camera over there is recording, the, the computer behind the camera will replace with my whatever is shown on my screen. And I have a, a, a screen over there, I can see the preview. So whenever I, I see the, the content of my screen and I see myself on top of the screen, and I can use the preview to, for example, guide my arm here, so I can, I can kind of take this cord and, and pull it here. 
And if you want to see what the room actually looks like, the curtain is here, I can just pull it out. And, and this is like a normal office door here. So this is, this is my, my setup. Whatever is, is green is replaced with the computer. And uh, there's a preview screen. This is what it looks like from the presenter's perspective. So there's a camera that I'm staring at. There's another preview screen behind the camera. You can see I'm taking a photo using my cell phone and uh, the camera is on. So uh, then there's my computer here. There you can see the computer has, is showing a slide that I use for presenting positioning. And then I'm shown, I'm put over the slide. The actual computer is behind this uh, acoustic wall here. Here's a place for doing screencast. And it's actually, it's very simple teleservice studio. So when I want to present or record something, I just book it. It's like the way you would book any lecture hall or any meeting room. I come here, I switch on the light, and then the computer has a touch screen. There are four different modes. I choose the mode, the green screen studio here, and then I click start. It starts recording. When I'm done, I click stop, and then I email our video guy that I did a recording, and they will cut out from the beginning where I I step in front of the camera and then they will cut out the end where I walk away from the camera to the computer and then they'll upload it on our, our uh, media server from where I can get it myself. So this is a, a simple easy to use studio that I apply and the idea of, of this studio is that the university wants to make it as simple as possible for people to do lecture content or video content for their courses. So that was briefly about myself, what this channel is about why I do this channel and how I do the videos. I hope you find the videos entertaining and educational.